So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this last uh, scientific evening. Today's speaker is Professor Mateusz Dular. He is a full professor at the University of Ljubljana since 2017. <clears throat> he did uh, his master and PhD in the same university. Then he spent uh, quite some time abroad in Germany and France. And finally, he came back uh, to Slovenia. He is co-author of uh, <clears throat> more than 50 international peer-reviewed publications. He published also a chapter of a book. <clears throat> Recently, he has been awarded, uh, he was principal investigator of um, two projects funded by the European Space Agency. And uh, recently, he, earned, uh, he was awarded an ERC consolidator grant. So today, he will speak about uh, cavitational bubbles, the good, the bad, and the beautiful. So please, Professor Dular, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, let me just start the presentation. Yes, so thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so as Barbara already said, uh, today I'll speak about cavitation bubbles and cavitation in general, uh, and I'll focus on the good and the bad type of cavitation, and I hope that during the lecture you will also see that it can also be beautiful. That's basically the, the thing that drives me. It's a really, really beautiful phenomenon. As you can see here, a single cavitation bubble imploding. We'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll simply start by what is cavitation, right? Uh, so I've put here a, a very simple diagram which shows you the three possible states of water. You can have it in ice, in, in liquid, or in uh, vaporous uh, state. And so if we move from point A where it's at 20 degrees or one, one bar, uh, it's liquid, of course. And if we increase the temperature, we get to boiling, which we, um, of course, very well know. Uh, this happens at uh, pressure one bar. It happens at about um, 100 degrees centigrade. But the other way around it to, to get to evaporation is, of course, if you lower the pressure, right? And if you, if you have to lower it to a very, very low pressure, at 20 degrees, this pressure would be about um, 0 0.03 bar, so 3,000 pascals, very low pressure. And that the simplest way to show you this, if you put a very small amount of water into a syringe, you, 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 um, you seal it at the top and you, you increase the volume, of course, the pressure will fall and bubbles will form. Uh, this is actually not entirely true. This, these bubbles that you can see here are actually uh, gases bubbles inside the liquid, which get out of the liquid when, when you, you decrease the pressure. Something similar what would happen if you open the bottle of a mineral water. It's something like this. But if you would con continue to do this, then these bubbles would start to grow and grow and grow, and this would be then evaporation and cavitation would occur. Um, so. Um, how do we get to, to, to this state? What, what, what is cavitation in, in most basic, basic physical form? Uh, we, can, we can imagine basically a solid, uh, let's say a metal rod, and if, if you would pull this rod from each end, right, it would break at some point. So that, that's very logical to us. Um, but you can do the same thing with liquid, right? If you have a liquid, a perfect liquid, and if you stretch it, liquid has some kind of, surf, uh, of, of tensile strength. And if, if you stretch it too much, the liquid will break. And this is basically cavitation. Uh, it's a little bit hard to understand, but imagine if you have a very small, small uh, imperfection in, inside the uh, metal, this will cause the metal to break at that point. And the same thing can happen in liquid. If you have a small imperfection inside the liquid, let's say a gas, gaseous bubble, this imperfection will cause cavitation. The liquid will break at that point, right? That's the most basic way, way to, to describe cavitation. And you can actually do this by experiment. And we did this about uh, five years ago. Um, I'll just play the movie. I hope you can see it. Um, I will comment it a little bit later. So what we have is, uh, is a, 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 a tube with very, very pure water inside. And as you can see, the Point number three is, is, is a spring, and you can, you can pull down the tube, you release it, it moves up very fastly, it hits the uh, uh, um, obstacle, which is number four, so it stops 
immediately, but the liquid wants to, 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 to continue the movement, so you basically stretch it, right? And number five there is a thin metal rod, and this rod at the end has a very, very small bubble, which is basically our incipient point. And at this point, we, we force the, the water to break, to, 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 to rapture, basically. And you can see this here. You can see the bottom part of the, of the tube. It moves upwards, and as it stops, it, the movie will start again soon, I hope. Um, let's see. Some, some seconds. So now, the, 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 if you look very carefully, the, the tube is moving up, it stops, and now a bubble forms. And it's a huge bubble. Actually, it's about uh, 20 millimeters in diameter. You can create a very, very big bubbles uh, with this. Um, so it's a very simple experiment, but it had, in my case, it had a very big, big applications implications because this was actually the first time that we were able to measure very precisely the temperatures very near the bubble. And this, it was not purely coincidental. I knew that this is where I was going. It was very interesting for the European Space Agency at that time. So that's the reason why I got the two, two grants afterwards from that. Um, so this was the first proof of concept. So it's going on. Okay. So let's go back to the, to the title. And um, when I was preparing this lecture, I was, um, you're a very hard crowd. <laughs> because you're all probably experts in your own field, so it's very hard to, to make a presentation which is not boring, but uh, not too, too detailed for everybody. So I will show a lot of pictures. I will go in some points. I will go in a little bit more in detail uh, so that you will see the level that, uh, of, of, of science that we are, we are going there, right? But in, in majority, it will be a very, very simple lecture. I hope it won't be too, too boring for you. Uh, so yes, why is cavitation beautiful? Um, I find it beautiful, I don't know why. It's, it's, it's a very dynamical process. It's very rich in, in, in structures. It's a multi-scale phenomenon because this, this sphere that you can see here, what, what you're seeing here is a sphere inside the flow. So the flow is moving from the left to the right at about 20 meters per second. In this case, this was done in Australia. Um, uh, and you can, can see these structures which are about this big, right? The, the, the tunnel, the, the facility where they, they, they are working with this is about 80 meters long. So it's a huge, huge tunnel which was developed during the last 30 years. So it's, it's a huge thing. Uh, but when you go deeper, you can see that it has inner structures and inner structures have smaller bubbles and smaller bubbles. And these bubbles go down to nano bubbles at the end, right? So it's a very, very complicated phenomenon to, to understand. And that's, the, that's what it makes it interesting for research. Um, Okay, why it's bad? Bad is, and this is basically why, why cavitation became interesting for the researcher, and I will talk about this, this part of, of uh, cavitation for the most part of this lecture, is because it can cause erosion. And um, this is, for example, uh, I think it's a ship propeller, I'm not sure. And you can see the damages which are created by cavitation bubbles. So it's a metal, it's an inox uh, steel, and it was damaged during, during the tests by solely by cavitation. I will show you more, more results about this later. So it's really a bad phenomenon. But it can also be good. And the idea is if it can damage metal, for example, maybe it can damage bacteria. Maybe you can use these extreme environments within the bubble for chemistry, for biology, for, for many, many different purposes. For example, this, this uh, work here was done in, in Göttingen in, in Germany. And this is actually a study of how, how you can make sonochemical reactions. So you can, you can, um, you can increase the, the uh, speed of reactions by introducing sonic waves, which actually stretch the water again and create cavitation. And this cavitation bubble implode, and, and they make reactions much faster or better or more efficient. I'm not a chemist, so I cannot really comment much on this topic. OK. So, Let's get back to the basics. We're now looking at the single bubble. The, the experiment here on the, on the left was actually done in our lab. Uh, so what you can see, it, it's, it's a very simple experiment again, but now we're not stretching the fluid. What we're doing, we're basically discharging a capacitator at a high voltage, and you, have, you create plasma, and a bubble is formed. The movie which you see here is, uh, is made, uh, by, I think it has 300,000 frames per second. So it's a very, very fast phenomenon, what you're looking at. Right? So you have 
a bubble which is created and then it collapses almost spherically. Um, you cannot see it very well on this movie. Maybe I'll, I'll just wait for a little bit. Um, when it collapses, you will sh see that the, the whole image shatters a little bit. Uh, it's very hard to see, but you can actually see the shock wave which was created by, at the bubble collapse. And you can see this much better in the next movie, which is not ours, it's from Switzerland. And now you can see the shock waves really, really nicely. It's for different types of bubbles at a different, um, at a different uh, deformation level, they call it. But you can see these enormous shock waves which are created at bubble collapse. And these shock waves actually can damage the surface. It's not that simple, but that's the, that's the main idea. Um, actually, this, this study was really nice because it was done in, in zero G in, in the airplane because they wanted to have a perfectly infinite environment for the bubble so it would be really, really collapse in the most spherical possible way. So they're flying the, the, the airplanes almost every six months or so to do tests like this. Um, okay, but single bubbles by themselves are not that interesting in terms of application. What's interesting is when you have a number of bubbles, what I've shown you at the picture when it said cavitation, the beautiful one, right? And this is basically the part where I'm most familiar with. And um, if I just turn it on, um, what, we, what we have here is uh, that's, that's uh, just a movie made, made by a cell phone. So you can see it's very, very fast and very chaotic. And it's all sorts of things are going on in here. And what you have here is actually you have a Venturi tube. So that means that you're forcing a flow through the, through the some kind of obstacle or, or some narrowing. And because water is almost incompre incompressible, it will speed up because it has a high velocity. Basically, the pressure will drop. And if it drops below that, that, that boundary pressure of about 3,000 Pascal, you will form bubbles. And this is how it looks like in reality. It's the same geometry that you see here. So, and if we look at it a little bit more closely, three cases. So that's the same, the, the, the movie that you've seen before is actually the middle one that you see here now. But this one is recorded by about 10,000 frames per second. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, so you see three different types of cavitation here. And that's, that's really important. This is something that we, we engineers understand very well. Uh, and, but for example, biologists and chemists which, who are using cavitation for the good purposes, right? Uh, they don't understand this. And this was one of the points which was key to, to let's say, my success in the ERC application. Because I, I did bring some new knowledge to this field of work when I started to work with uh, chemists and uh, uh, biologists. Um, so what you see here, here for example, the, the upper one, it has a very small, small uh, cavitation structure there. This middle one, we call this, we call this uh, developed cavitation. You have all sorts of phenomena. You have, basically, you have supersonic flow in here. Uh, what happens is if you have, if you have um, a mixture of, of bubbles and, and, and liquid, if you have a mixture of this, the sonic velocity can drop down to maybe 10 meters per second, and you will have shock waves because it's a supersonic flow in there. So it's very, very complicated phenomena, uh, flow, flow, flow structures, what you're looking at. And then the, the, the lowest one, we call this supercavitation. And supercavitation is basically just one very, very huge bubble. This is just one bubble which stretches through the whole, whole flow section. This is important for a not very, very nice purpose. Uh, because they're making uh, torpedoes for the submarines. They're using this phenomenon to, to basically uh, envelop, uh, make an envelope of, of, of vapor bubble around the torpedo, and the torpedo can travel underwater much, much faster. The Russians got this idea, and I think the Germans are also using this, this now. It's not, not very well known. Not, not much data is uh, available about this, of course. Um, OK, so I said I will talk about erosion for the most part. Uh, and that's basically because I was dealing with erosion for my master thesis, for my PhD. And then uh, I said, OK, I will stop doing erosion because it's too much. And I stopped for a couple of years. And then I picked it up again. Uh, and I will basically show you a story how, how much the, the knowledge progressed during the last maybe 12, 15 years, and how this helped me to, to start working in other fields. So erosion, I have three pictures here. 
So you can see the ship propeller there. Um, ships, ship propellers are almost always cavitating. If, if the ship propeller is not cavitating, I'm, I'm talking about the large ships, it, it's a bad propeller. That's, that's basically <laughs> the, the, the state of the art right now. And it's not that bad for the propeller that it's cavitating, it's very bad for the rudder because the bubbles will travel downstream and they will implode on the rudder. And the picture below that you see there is actually damage on the rudder which was positioned downstream of the propeller. And it can get that bad that there was a coincidence, not coincidence, there was a, 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 a once incident where, where during the, 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 the first test of the ship, when the buyer came there to buy the ship, they made the test and they lost the rudder because it just eroded away. Right? It, it happened. In, in Holland. Uh, and the, the, the bottom picture there, that's actually not that far from here. It's from a water turbine that on the Socha River. And you can see the damages which were created on the blade. Uh, and this is ab about one year out in, into the operation. And you can see it's quite substantial damage that you can see here. And the costs that to, to fix this are at, at a level about one, 100,000 euros to fix this, this damage. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really serious problem, right? Um, but now, how, how, the, how this cavitation erosion happens? So, um, I'll start with our understanding in 2004. So this was basically somewhere to, to, towards the end of my PhD thesis, right? Uh, my idea was such, right? You have cavitation cloud, and this cloud collapses. You could see it, it collapses. Basically, you have cavitation and it, it, it sheds a little cloud of bubbles and this cloud of bubbles disappears and it creates a shock wave. And this shock wave uh, from the cloud is huge, but it's not that huge. So it's, it's in the range of, let's say, 60 to 100 bar. It's not big enough to damage the, the, the material, so there needs to be something else in between, right? So the second point there, what is in between? It's single bubbles. You have single bubbles very near the, the surface, and when this shock wave reaches a single bubble, but the bubble becomes unstable and it implodes. And one way it, which it can implode in is the one that I've shown you on the first slide. This was this, this, this jet of, of liquid through the bubble. It's called microjet. And this jet of liquid which is there, uh, the bubble becomes something like, like an American, American donut shape. You have a jet of liquid towards the surface of the, of the metal, and this jet can reach 100, 200 meters per second. It's a huge velocity. And if you calculate the water hammer pressure, which would be the velocity times the sonic velocity in liquid, which is about 1,500, times the density, you get to about 1,500 megapascal, I think, or bar, I'm not sure. Bar, I think. So you're at that level where, where you can damage the surface really, really simply, right? And, okay, okay number three is you create a pit, right? Um, uh, okay. Um, okay, this is just, so this was my idea, and I used basically the momentum equation to, 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 to tell this story in my PhD, and I worked partially, actually, uh, up until this, this, this image here, we, we and Rijan Fartus Patela, we presented the same idea at the same conference, one, one talk after the other. She just used the energy equation and I used the momentum equation for the same story. So I was really at the top at that time. The, the, in Grenoble, they were really the, the, the leading department in, in erosion research at that time. And I was working in Darmstadt in Germany at that time. Um, so, okay, so I, I did use these equations to, to, to somehow I used math to tell this story that I've shown you, and I, I could predict cavitation erosion by this, right? And in 2006, this is how it looked like. So you see the measurements. So what we did, we did measurements on a, on a it's a hydrofoil. Basically, it's, it's like a wing, but you don't put it into air. You put it into water, and it cavitates, so you have cavitation on it. And the bubbles implode, and they create damage, right? And uh, these are the damage patterns. So we made maybe 30 different uh, 30 different uh, operating points to measure the, this, this damage map. So the black, the black regions there are the amount of damage which was sustained after one hour of exposure to cavitation. And our predictions are, I would say, really good. Right? 
we could predict this, this, this behavior from our model. So it was a very, very good result. And this paper, which was published in 2006, is still one of my, my, my most cited papers. And everybody's using it, everybody's implementing this into CFD, and everybody's really happy with it. Um, but I, I basically stopped working. Oh, OK, I didn't stop working at that, that, that time. Oops, sorry. Um, then I started to work with, with people from, from France a little bit more intensively. And we said, OK, so our model is OK, but let's try to implement this into really state-of-the-art CFD. So we started to work with computational fluid dynamics. And uh, Olivier Coutier de Gaucha was really at the top in the world in that time. Uh, so we worked, uh, we did the work actually about a few years before 2009. And what you can see here is um, actually the, the line there. So that's the hydrofoil with some kind of simulation on it. And it's a transient simulation. So what you see is basically the pressure on the upper surface of the, of the hydrofoil. So the, the, when it's very low, that means you're inside the cavitation cloud because you have, you have vapor there. So it's, it's about 3,000 Pascal. And then you see that this, this movement of, of this lower pressure zone, this means that there's a cloud of bubbles which is moving along the hydrofoil, and at some point, it jumps up. And this is implosion of cavitation cloud. OK, what you see. It's a little bit hard to understand. Um, and the bottom, bottom diagram is actually erosion, which is predicted by the model. Right? So every time you see the upper diagram jump, you will see also a little bit of a jump at the bottom diagram, which is now it will happen probably. So now it collapsed, you saw, and there was an increase in cavitation erosion. So it's quite, quite um, a good model that, to, to predict this. And just to have the, an idea, what's the time resolution that we need for this? It's about uh, one microsecond. So we need to calculate the flow during one microsecond. Every one microsecond, we need to make time steps so small. Otherwise, we cannot resolve the shock waves because they're so fast. You can make a simulation without compressibility effects and stuff like this with about 20 microsecond time steps. But if you want to really resolve this, you need to much, 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 much uh, more, more precise simulations. Um, OK, and this is basically comparison of this simulation to the experiments. So that the points and with error bars, these are the, the experimental values for four different uh, test cases and our predictions. And they are fairly good. We were quite happy with it uh, at that point. At least we got the, the position more or less correct and also the, the, the extension of, uh, extent of the damage. The big problem there was, and this is the next one, that because we need such a, such a precise simulation, we can only do simulation of about 0 0.1 seconds of flow time. So 0 0.1 seconds of flow time, this means about 30 periods of this cavitation shedding cycle. So at 30 instances, I would get erosion. And then I would compare this to an experiment which was one hour long. And this was a state-of-the-art experiment. Nobody could do it faster at that time. Right? Uh, and that's kind of a problem if you do that. right? Because you're just saying, OK, I got this much erosion in 0 0.1 seconds. And I just multiply this by 36,000. And this is what I would get in one hour. Right? That, 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 that's how we did it. Um, so this was my, 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 my motivation to, to say, can we, can we increase, can we put these two, two values a little bit closer together? And it took me a couple of years to figure out how to do it. At the end, it was very simple. It was just a lot of work, and a lot of master students were unhappy with me. Um, and what we did is, um, at that time, we, we, we started to really invest a lot into high-speed cameras, and what we did uh, this is now already in 2015. What we did is we used a couple of high-speed cameras. And you, you can see the geometry. It's again Venturi inside. So the flow goes through this, this geometry, and it will cavitate on it uh, and cause damage, right? And then we use three high-speed cameras just to see how cavitation looks like. And we use another high-speed camera to look through this, this Venturi section. The, the, it was, everything was transparent. And on the Venturi section, I would have a very thin aluminum foil attached with a transparent tape, basically. And if there was damage on the foil, I would see it from the other side. So it was a very simple idea, right? And I can do everything by recording this in high speed at 30,000 frames per second in this case. 
And the results looked like this. So what you're seeing here is five different, I won't go into details, I have a nicer picture later. Um, you can see different, different types of collapses of clouds and the white, white pictures which are appearing are actually, it's, it's, it's actually data from the camera which was looking at the damage, right? So these, these are images of, of, of cavitation and then I have superimposed the image, uh, the data from, from the camera which was looking at the damage. Uh, and what we, what we found out when we uh, went through millions of pictures, which was not very easy to do, is that it's actually not just one mechanism. So my PhD, my, the idea of my PhD was, was the, the bottom left corner. So I have a cloud, it collapses, it causes a shockwave and creates pits. This was my PhD. And during, so 10 years later, we found out it's not just one mechanism, it's four, four additional mechanisms that nobody knew, knew anything about them. We did su su suspect that something else might be going on, but nobody was really capable of measuring this or, or proving that this, this is true, right? So we basically showed with this work that, that my PhD was, if, if I'm optimistic, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was too simple <laughs> reasoning if I'm, not so optimistic, it was wrong. So, um, so this was three years ago, and this was a big hit during the community because now they're, they're seeing, okay, we need to put more, more effort into understanding what goes on in cavitation clouds and structures and so on. But we didn't stop there, so I'll just move on. So this is the part, this is my PhD up there, right? Uh, so in 2015, we figured out it's not just the cloud, it's much more complicated. And then, and these results which I will show now, these are actually, uh, they were first presented last Tuesday in USA. So they're very, very fresh. Is what is going on with this single cavitation bubble, right? We were saying, okay, we have this jet and it makes 100, 200 meters per second. So it makes sense that this is the mechanism which causes erosion, right? But in some cases, what happened is, you would see a, a, a single hole uh, under, you would see a, a hole under the bubble, and in some, some instances, you would not see this hole, you would see only a, a rim of damage. So we, we really could not explain what is going on there, right? So we said, okay, let's try and use this same technique, but now on a single bubble. And we would probably done it before, but we didn't have the, the camera to do it, but then we invested again to, for a better camera. Uh, and what you're seeing now, is a single bubble recorded at, uh, I think, 200,000 frames per second. It collapses. This is now, you can see the, the, the blue is basically the, the surface, and the red point is how far away is it, right? So it's actually on the surface. And the diagram below shows you, shows you the damage which, which was extracted from the second camera, which was looking, again, at the surface from the bottom side. So you can see the bubble collapses. It does create this microjet and causes damage. So it was quite a good result. But then he said, what if we move a little bit further away? Oops. Let's see. Look. Okay, so now we're a little bit further away, and we see now there was damage, and then afterwards we have this rim, where people were talking about the rim. So it's, it's not that simple anymore. So you have two, two, two mechanisms now. You have the damage from the microjet and the damage from collapse of this second, secondary collapse of the bubble. So it's more complicated. And if you move even further, you will see that the microjet doesn't have any influence anymore because it's too far, but you get damage on the, on the perimeter of the bubble. So it's, it's, it's even more complicated than we thought. And then we played a little bit more and we said, okay, what if we have flow? Because in turbines, we always have flow. So now the flow is also pushing the bubble towards the, from, from right, right to the left. And you can see that now, before we would see this, this rim pattern, but now it's only microjet, which is important. And this was something really new. Nobody knew, knew that this is true. So as I told you, this is just about one week old. Uh, and um, it, it was not that well accepted because it's, it's really um, breaking apart the whole, the whole modeling of cavitation erosion. So, but it's good for science, I guess. So, okay. So because we have a very high speed camera, which goes up to 2 million frames per second, we, we played a little bit further. And this is now just, just one single bubble. We do, you don't see the bubble. So we used 
the, the time resolution of these images are is 2 million frames per second. So it's less 2.1 million frames, less than one mic, uh, half of a microsecond. And what you can see, the, when the bubble collapses, I will just move like this. When the bubble collapses, it creates a pit which is really, really deep, about 30 microns. So you have basically elastic deformation, plastic deformation, but then it relaxes back, right? So we can see plastic and elastic deformation and then relaxation afterwards. So that's really, really something that nobody was able to measure um, up, up until before last week, basically. Um, yeah, so is there any hope for this? I don't know. So the, 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 the way how, how to approach this is by, by simulations, basically, I think. Um, so I won't go into an equation, in equations. Uh, it's just very, very complicated. What I wanted to show, it's complicated to solve, to solve cavitation because you have, okay, continuity, momentum. You have to solve energy equations because you have temperature variations. You have com compressibility. You need to take into account liquid compressibility. Of course, the flow is turbulent. Then the flow is two-phase flow. And then you have transfer from one phase to the other and back. And then it's so fast that, that, that simple models which exist are not really working very well. So we worked a lot to improve those models. And then you can make really, really good simulations. Um, and we are not even, there are groups in Munich which are really good. We are kind of OK. Um, so this is, for example, a simulation of this type of cavitation with what I was talking about. So you, have, you can see. Cavitation cloud grows, then it separates, and, and then you can see the pressure, it, it, it increases, you can see the shock wave and everything. And you can also do the same thing on a single bubbles. So we have experiment and, and, and computation. And the funny thing here that computation was done in 2009, I think, and experiment was done in 2017, and I've just put them toge together a month ago or so. But it looks kind of similar. We did not work much further in this, in this direction lately but we will in the next couple of years. So we can also, you can see this microjet really nicely here, at least in, 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 a, in CFD. Okay, so why do we even bother? So if I didn't convince you that cavitation erosion is a big problem, I can convince you with this picture. So this is actually the, the Glen Dam. This is Lake Powell. It's a little bit upstream from the Hoover Dam, which probably everybody knows. And there, is a big, uh, there was a big problem at some point, eight, maybe 30 years ago. Um, so this is actually cavitation erosion damage, at the, the, the biggest one recorded ever. Um, so what, what, what are you looking at here is they have these so-called spillways. If the water behind the dam would get too high, they would need to drain it. They, they're not, you cannot allow the water to go over, over the dam, right? So you have, the, you have a very huge tubes, you can see them there where the water basically is passed by the turbine. So it doesn't go through the turbine, but it just it gets out of the dam. And because it has some, some curves and so on, it, the curve were, curves at that time were not uh, designed properly, this is what happened during one hour. Right? They, they, these small bubbles that I'm talking about made this hole which was 40 meters long and so on. You can see the ladder that the workers needed to get down. Right? So it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, but my motivation in this is a little bit different, and this is um, where, where I actually entered this uh, work for the European Space Agency. Um, and you're probably going to wonder what does cavitation and water has to do with rocket propulsion. Actually, uh, water doesn't have much to do with it, but in rockets, in liquid rockets, what you need to do, you need to put an enormous amount of fuel and oxidizer into the nozzle at a very, very high speed. And the pumps there are always cavitating. It's impossible to make a pump which would not cavitate, right? The good thing about it, it only needs to last about two minutes. Afterwards, the, the rocket is empty, so you can throw it away. Uh, the bad thing is that they want to make reusable rockets, right? So two minutes is now getting more to four, six, eight, ten, if you want to reuse it, right? For example, space shuttle engine, which was space shuttle, which was reusable, they had to replace these these pumps every time because they, they could not make it um, design it well enough. Um, the pumps in there are are operating at crazy crazy speeds. So we're talking about 50 to 100 revolutions per minute. 
The pump is about this big, and the, 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 probably the most impressive um, number that I can give you is when you start the pump, so it's, it's standing still, and then to reach this velocity of, let's say, 50,000 revolutions per minute, it needs one revolution. If, it, if it's slower, then the, the whole cycle doesn't start and the rocket won't start. So you need one revolution to get there, right? I was there in France at one, one of such tests, and the whole test section just jumped uh, when, when they did this, this fast startup test. Um, so this is how it looks actually inside. And yeah, and it can get very wrong very fast. And this is an example of a Japanese rocket in 99. This is this part of the pump, and you can see the damage. This was done, this happened within a couple of seconds, basically. And this is actually a pump, pump, uh, pump part of this, of this rocket. Um, this person there, this is uh, Yoshi, Yoshi Tsujimoto, and he was actually responsible for fixing this problem for the Japanese space program. And I was really lucky in 2015 that we shared a university apartment in, in, in France that we could work together on, on similar problems. So I learned a really, really, really a lot of, from him. And they even let me play with the, with the real stuff. For, this was for the last test of Ariane 5 inducer pump. And then this is still kind of confidential. This is what they gave me. Uh, it's for the Ariane 6 rocket, right? They're, they're not allowed to say or show anything right now. So um, it's really, really very, very confidential part of work that you do for them. Um, yeah, so what, what, what else did we do for this, for this space agency? What, what was the problem? Why did they say, look, in Slovenia, they can do something? What, what we proposed to them was, was this. Um, the problem in, 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 in cavitation in, in exotic fluids, like, like liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, or, or cryogenic fluids, is there, there is no experimental data available. The point that you can see there, Okay, the red arrow shows it. This is the only experimental point that existed in 2011. And the, the lines there, this is CFD, and it was fitted and calibrated to meet this point, right? This is how bad it was. Because all the experimental research was basically done in the US during the 60s because they had to go to, to, to the moon, they had to beat the Russians. And afterwards, they said, okay, we can do a, a rocket engine, don't bother, right? But now when they want to make rockets reusable, more efficient and so on, this is becoming an issue. So this was the state of the art in 2011, how to measure some, some temperatures within the bubbles. And this is what we were able to do. I won't go into details, but we really basically provided an enormous amount of experimental data that now researchers who are developing these pumps can use to calibrate their, their softwares and so on. So this is what, what I was doing during the last six years or so. Okay, so this is basically the last part, and now, now it comes to the, to the good side of cavitation. I was talking only about the bad part of cavitation. So what about the good part? So cavitation is already used in many, many processes. You don't even know it, right? Uh, for example, in ultrasonic cleaning. Uh, when you go to the dentist, you will see that he will put the instruments into this ultrasonic bath. They switch it on, it makes some, some zip sound, but these are actually cavitation bubbles, which are produced by ultrasound, which are cleaning the surfaces. You, you should not put hands inside, it's not, not that healthy. Um, but if you do, it's kind of, you can see the, the, the you can feel the, the bubbles picking you a little bit, right? Um, so if for a few seconds, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, for, for example, um, if you have kidney stones, they don't open you up anymore, they use cavitation, to destroy the kidney stones to make them smaller, and you can basically uh, wash them out of your body without an operation. This is also a very useful application. Or sonochemistry, sonochemical reactions are already being used. The problem of them is that nobody really knows how well, it, how, 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 how well they work. And this is where, okay, then, then it's water treatment, and we are really, really active in water treatment. We, we, we worked on this for, for a number of years, for, from 2012 to 2016, and it all finished in, in one big, big paper 
where we showed that yes, you can use cavitation in, in many processes. For example, you can remove pharmaceuticals from wastewater. You can increase biogas production. You can kill bacteria. You can, we, we kind of shown that you can kill, you can inactivate viruses at that time. So it's very, very useful, useful uh, method. And then came two milestones um, for me and for my project, the ERC project, which was, we really made a big effort to show how, how uh, cavitation inactivates viruses. Right? And this was a big hit. Even the editors named it a historical mi milestone and so on. Uh, it was really, really something, something new. And then there was a second milestone oops, where we used a different type of cavitation to kill the bacteria, right? A completely different type. And what we found out that if you want to inactivate the virus, you need a very aggressive cavitation, the same one that damages the surfaces. If you want to kill the bacteria, you need the most gentle type of cavitation. So the mechanism is completely different here. And nobody realized this before, nobody published this before us. So the key moment was, that we acknowledge that cavitation basically is a black box. We have some contaminated fluid which comes into the box, which contains cavitation, and a cleaner fluid goes out. But what happens inside, we have no idea. So we don't know what happens, we don't know how, if we are already at the limit, and basically we cannot make good technology out of this because of this gap of knowledge, right? So the aim for future is to fully understand the mechanisms by which cavitation Bubbles act upon viruses, bacteria, chemis, chemicals, and so on. And this, of course, is then also the core, basically, of the, this ERC project. We want to investigate the mechanisms between the bubbles and contaminants. And what we want to achieve during these next five years is just to pinpoint the mechanisms. We want to really work a lot on experiments. It will be mostly experimental project to really increase the, the level of quality of experiments so that the, the computational guys will be able to, to, to see if their simulations are not just beautiful, but also correct. Uh, and also advance the bubble dynamics, of course. And of course, we can also use it in ecology, in engineering, in medicine, medicine and chemistry. I think I'm almost at the end. Ah, okay, so I have to say thanks. And I'm saying, saying thanks by, by cavitation bubbles. Um, we can also make patterns of bubbles. So this is also something that we will work a lot during the next, next five years to put bacteria near these bubbles and see how they interact between each other. And of course, I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't have these three really nice sponsors. And I'm going to finish with another beautiful movie. <laughs> of cavitation, how you can make a, a, a bottle break. You can see, you basically create the tension in the water, bubbles are created, when they implode, they create a shock wave, and this basically breaks the bottle uh, in these in this experiments, I call it. Um, two more things, and then I'm finished. If somebody has more interest in this, we'll have a workshop of, on how to use cavitation at the end of September. And if somebody doesn't know what to do after graduation, but has interest in this, we have a couple of PhD positions open in Ljubljana. I know that uh, I shouldn't make uh, uh, commercials for our university, but please contact me if you want. So I think I'm done. Thank you. <clears throat>
this was done under these huge bubbles of 20 millimeters. And we were looking at the temperatures in the thermal boundary layer, and this was in the range of, I would say, about 20, 20 microns. It was, it was, for sure, it was not thinner, because otherwise, I would, if I would use an infrared camera, I, I could look through it. But you cannot look through water if it's thicker than, than you know, 10 or 20 microns. So I'm, I'm thinking about in, in that range, but I'm estimating. Is there any interaction between bubble to bubble? Do you know where does it come from? Interaction between the bubbles? Yeah, there's a lot of interaction between the bubbles, but uh, it's very hard to study. This Van der Waals? Sorry? Van der Waals. Van der Waals. What, what, what? Uh, the, uh, it's, it's more the, uh, the, the, it's called the Bjerknes forces between the bubbles. It's something, it kind of works similar to gravity, I would say. So, mm -hmm. if, you would scale it up, if you would scale this force really to a huge level, it's kind of similar to gravity between two objects, so it kind of works in the same way. Um, but if you have one bubble and another one, this will of course interact immensely, but for example in, in, in computations you just don't care about it, right? Because you're saying everything is a mixture, I don't care about it, but it can play a significant role there. This is something that we also want to study in, in uh, this, this kind of movies, right? This is one of the, one of the points of the project. To investigate this. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, okay. I can take it. Uh, there are similarities to water jet cutting. Uh, is there any <laughs> other relations? Of there you have pressures of 3,000 or 4,000 bars and yeah. speeds are 1,000 meters well, per second. Um, it is similar, but uh, in water jet cutting, what you would have, uh, you need higher pressure than here, uh, higher velocity than here, uh, because you're using basically a stagnation pressure. What, what happens is that um, when you have a jet, right, uh, when the jet first touches the, the surface, you get the water hammer pressure, which is enormous. And then if you say, let's like the jet, I'm exaggerating, if the jet, jet is this big, when it hits the surface, you will have a shock wave which travels from the center towards the other parts, right? And during this time, during this time of travel, this, this, you will have this water hammer pressure. Afterwards, you're reduced to, to the stagnation pressure. And it drops for one, one, one order of magnitude, for example. So in water jet, what you're having, you're having a water, water uh, you're having stagnation pressure, and in cavitation, most of the action happens during the, the, the water hammer pressure. And we, we also proved this basically with, with this uh, study with, with the highest frame rate, because all the damage basically occurred during 0 0.5 microseconds, right? And if I was, I measured the diameter of the jet and I calculated the, the time which was needed for, the, for this shock wave to traverse it, and it was almost exactly, it was 0 0.4 microseconds. So it, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Maybe if, if I go further, there were ideas to, to use cavitation, to use water jet to cut, but then to shoot a uh, laser into the water jet mm. to basically make, make small, small packets of water jet, and then, then you would have water hammer pressure. And it could, could, could cut much, much faster this way. I'm not sure if it was applied in any case, but um, that was one of the ideas some years ago. Uh, my second question would be uh, if, uh, there is uh, some research on cavitation assisted cutting. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> cutting. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I read it some years ago that this was one of the ideas, but I, I'm, I'm not really not sure. Any more questions? I have one, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is the effect of the density of the liquid on the bubbles? Uh, the because at the beginning you showed that this nice image with pure water and uh... um, yeah okay the the purity of water is not directly it's not density basically if you have um, very dirty water this would mean that I would I wouldn't be able to create one single bubble in a dirty liquid because every every small imperfection inside the water would basically create a bubble so I would get a cloud that's why I needed to really purify it right. Um, but the density itself, um, if, we, if 
we are saying well, this microjet, then it's just linear, right? The, the, the higher the density, the more damage it will create, right? One of the most aggressive cavitations that you could have is, for example, in, in, um, in uh, nuclear reactors, which are cooled down by, by uh, natrium, no, put, natrium, potassium, I'm not sure, sodium, sodium, sorry. Uh, by sodium, right, so it's basically liquid metal and, and uh, uh, you can have very, very aggressive cavitation inside there. They're actually doing experiment in, in, in mercury for this, but it's kind of dangerous to do that. I mean, they have one test trick in, in Grenoble, I know that, but I was never allowed to see it. <laughs> so. Okay, if not, we thank our speaker again. Thank you.